So um, we are the uh, Sustainability League. Uh, we're here presenting on droughts because we feel like this is the biggest um, climate catastrophe that we face in the future. And uh, we feel that Congress needs to focus as much attention on this issue as possible. Um, droughts have are pretty common in history. I'm not going to go through what a drought is because I assume all, you all know it. Uh, it's very um, connected with um, falls of gov or the collapse of governments. As you can see right here, we've got a picture of Californian uh, um, unrest because of the current drought. Uh, and also just cultural disasters. It's frankly can just be extremely detrimental and can lead to extinction of a whole culture or community. We can skip the rest of this. Isn't it? These are just some examples of what a drought would look like, just to familiar so familiarize yourself with the images. Um, I'm sure the California representatives in here are already very familiar. Um, so yeah, worst case scenario is basically Armageddon. Um, it's a nationwide drought, uh, which you will see is very likely um, along the uh, next few slides, uh, widespread famine uh, because of basically uh, a decrease in agricultural production. Um, you can see poor drinking water supplies when you have constricted um, water supplies and usage. Uh, you're gonna see people try to find alternative usage when they don't have enough. Uh, so they might be going to water supplies that may not be so uh, hygienic and could lead to major other problems. Um, overload of aid pro um, programs, this is going to happen. When farmers don't produce enough agriculture and don't have enough money, they are going to go to the government for aid. So you'll see extreme increases in government aid during the drought. Um, and then risk of fire. Uh, risk it, with drier conditions, fire is going to be a lot more common, which we've seen in the West um, over the past few years. So, as you can see, um, according to researchers at Cornell University, the risk of a 35-year long uh, national drought is about 80% in the next 100 years. Um, and this is primarily going to impact the southwest and central plains areas, especially, as you can see in red, this is California. But keep in mind that this is really the breadbasket of the United States. This is where we grow our wheat and most of our agricultural products, but in a lot of the very red areas, there are very large population centers as well that are being affected. So we've created for you a graphic that essentially shows a history of droughts in our country. Um, this is uh, going to impact every single corner of the country. So as your representatives, look for your <laughs> uh, constituents on this. But keep in mind um, that uh, regardless of where the drought is actually hitting, it's going to be increasing the prices of food and certain commodities throughout. Um, the 1930s, you can see this is the Dust Bowl era. It's impacting wide swaths of the entire country. Um, the regions impacted are getting bigger and um, they're being more severe. This graphic doesn't show the severity, it just shows the, um, the regions being affected by the drought. But if you refer back to our previous slide, um, there are certain areas, especially the southwest, that are being impacted significantly more. Um, so uh, as we're go going through this, um, we also need to keep in mind that um, the, the regions that, the regions, as you can see, they're getting larger. Um, and as we get um, closer to the modern day, um, you can see these droughts are starting to impact the entire United States. So not only are the prices of food that rely on water, so like wheat um, and eggs, and um, <clears throat> these prices getting more expensive, but they're going to impact the entire country. So uh, we want to just give you a historical occurrences. Um, this is a quote from Steinbeck, um, who wrote about the Dust Bowl. Um, but the Dust Bowl cost um, the United States around 100 million in the 1930s, which is in the billions of dollars today. Um, and a northeastern drought um, in the 1960s um, <clears throat> caused significant um, spikes in the prices of food and other commodities. Okay, so likelihood. Um, it's 100%. This is already happening. I've discussed it in California. Uh, we've got some more pictures of California here. This, this is simply something that the United States have dealt with in our history, and we will continue to deal with. Uh, so, frankly, likelihood is it's, it's going to happen. Next slide. Uh, so, direct impacts. Uh, groundwater depletion is an extremely large problem that not many people know about here. Um, we've just got a graph over here of California groundwater depletion. Uh, which actually is even the worst. If you look at the Midwest, they're depleting groundwaters at uh, eight times uh, the amount that rain is refilling these groundwaters, which uh, could lead to in 20 years basically a 
a lack of groundwater in the Midwest, which would pretty much eliminate agriculture. Um, other things, I've already discussed the fire. I know a, a group is coming to present on fire later uh, today, so I'll let that group go on fire. Um, wind erosion is, it's, uh, the, when you have drier climates, when you have wind going through these crops, it's going to lead to uh, more crop death. It's, it's not just the water loss, it's other factors as well, as you can see with the two uh, next uh, points, plant disease and in, um, infant, uh, or I mean uh, insect infestations. Um, this, it's gonna basically compound to a disaster for our agricultural market, which is already struggling. Uh, next slide. Um, indirect impacts. Um, increased prices of food is a huge problem, ask any economist. Um, inflation on food prices probably affects um, households the most because that's probably the largest percentage that you are going to spend as a household. Households, uh, because of increased food prices due to droughts, we could see likelihoods of $2,000 increase per year uh, per household, which is huge. That could put people over the poverty line and would increase um, federal aid. Uh, unemployment, that's, that's not just farmers too. Um, yes, we will see farmers lose their jobs, uh, but you also see local grocery stores, um, more distribution along agriculture. It, it's not just one sector. That will have um, effects almost everywhere. Um, and then human migration, um, which wasn't, uh, which is becoming much of a bigger problem for us because we don't have anywhere to really migrate people. If we're going to see mass migrations from the Midwest uh, to the West or to the East, both of those have really big issues because the West is going to be facing those same conditions and the East is going to be extremely uh, populated and dense causing urban centers to uh, increase their chaos and problems with mass migrations. Um, current water usage, uh, this is just California per capita. We, or California just destroys almost every other country. We, we are the most in the world, or, and the US is along that same trend. Um, and 90, or 80 to 90% of that is coming, to agri or coming from agriculture. So we can't just focus on water conservation at the household level. We have to look mm -hmm. at agriculture and look at some sort of changes to make sure that we can sustain this in the future. So our current strategies, um, different communities are taking different strategies to adapt to the lack of water in their region. Some places in California are using desalination techniques, which we'll get into later is the wrong solution. Um, they have smart drip systems and water restrictions. We'll talk about um, water restrictions later as possibly an effective solution. Recycling water, crop rotation, and dams. Um, but we think that these solutions are not going far, far enough in order to address the problem. If you looked back, if you remember back into our graphic, the past 10 years or so have drastically increased the, increased the region being affected by drought. And these regions are just going to get larger and the severity of the drought are just going to get bigger. And we are not doing enough to really address this problem. So, the mitigation steps that we're suggesting to you today, number one is education of the public. Um, people need to, although, as we explained, the public don't consume the most water in their household when compared to agriculture, they still do consume some, and they have the, the purchasing power. So, when they're thinking about which products to buy, um, that can really determine what we spend our money on in terms of whether we're purchasing products that require a significant amount of virtual water to produce. So like things like meat cost a lot more in terms of how much water it takes to produce than things like vegetables or other other products. Um, so just educating the public on what to consume can could do a lot in terms of um, saving water in terms of a, a societal impact. Um, <clears throat> so our second mitigation step is just general water conservation. Um, so in the, before the droughts get so severe that we literally don't have rain anymore, which will probably, in, <laughs> in the next hundred years, we'll get there, but until we get there, we should invest in stormwater capture and rainwater harvest systems in order to save the water that we are getting. Um, because using these methods is a lot more effective, efficient, and significantly cheaper than trying to create fresh water from salt water, which is what um, desalination techniques are currently trying to do. Um, there's also significantly more energy efficient. Um, <clears throat> for wastewater recycling, um, there are some communities in California like San Diego investing in wastewater recycling uh, plants. And we think this, is, this could be a, an effective solution, but it does not go far enough in terms of being able to address the entire problem. They hope that their wastewater recycling plants in San Diego 
um, will allow them to meet one third of the demand for their region, but <laughs> we still have to come up for the, the other two thirds of the demand when uh, the Colorado River runs out, <laughs> which is going to happen. Um, we can also invest in conservative appliances like um, uh, washing machines that use less water, but again, this is such a, a sign insignificant amount of water that it's really not gonna do enough to address the entire problem, so we really need to recognize that. Um, so number three is charge for stages of overuse. This is kind of a governmental way in which we can force people to recognize how much water they're using. Um, this is a graphic of the stages of droughts, and the government could use uh, such a system like this to charge people for when they're using too much water. Essentially, it's a tax on water use. Um, and Santa Monica in California has already um, started doing this. And so they charge, I think, $10 uh, per HCF uh, when they use over, they use over the specified amount of water. Um, so number four is just developing new water sources. So ca catching, um, catching that uh, water in cisterns and rain barrels um, developing better technology, um, and having water treatment plants. It's kind of the same as number two. Um, so five, um, desalination. Um, right now, the technology for desalination is not energy efficient, and it's too expensive. Um, but we believe that Congress, um, if we're going to get to a point where it doesn't rain in the next 100 years, we need to start investing in, tech, in research and technology that will make desalination a more affordable and more energy efficient way to get clean water. Um, it's already being used in some, in some areas in the, in the world, mainly in the Middle East, where it's more <laughs> efficient, um, and they really just need water so much more, but eventually we're going to get to the point where we're needing the water as much as the Middle East is, and it would be great if our de desalination technology was a lot less energy efficient. So we really hope we can invest in research um, micro irrigation, um, it supposedly saves 20 to 50 percent more water than conventional um, farming techniques and irrigation techniques, and we think that this could be um, an interesting way to save water in the agricultural sector. Um, for sensory and response monitoring, this um, is a really interesting technique where you measure the amount of water in the soil so you're not overwatering and wasting water when you're growing crops. <coughs> Okay, so our resources to recovering quickly is putting these plans into implementation now. Uh, there's basically, we, we won't have some magical resources that we can store. We even reserves uh, will not help because as we see in California and in past droughts, these reserves get, uh, th or get used very fast. Uh, and it's, it's quite frankly just not a sustainable solution. Um, so now we're gonna get into the costs here. Um, so the, a 35 year, and mind you, these all these costs are just one year costs, and those will keep growing as it, it, as you get farther into a drought. So in a, a, an example of the 35 year drought, year to year, those costs will get more and more as you see the agricultural sector decline, as you see uh, more migration, and it, it's, it will compound as it goes. Um, so we would see a $22 billion, and this is an optimistic estimate, this is looking at California's um, uh, costs currently uh, for this past year, which is also only two years into a drought, um, and then looking at it as through the whole market here. Um, on the job side, um, we could see upwards of 80,000 uh, job loss, which is again optimistic because it's only looking at California's job loss and then looking at it uh, with the whole market as a whole, and um, which, as you know, job loss, bad. <laughs> Not very good for you guys getting really locked in. Um, Irrigation package. This is our mitigation package here, and I want to. I'm going to explain the package here for a second because this is a um, actually overestimate. Um, Four billion should cover making uh, all our current irrigation efficient or as efficient as possible, um, which, as Andrew talked, will go uh, strides for saving water. Um, but this still is not going to be extremely eff um, effective in the long term. Uh, we need to put more research in, as Andrew was discussing, for other things. So uh, there was an extra $1 billion for a package that Congress should decide what they would like to do, and I have a few options that I'd love to present. Um, first off, you can put that billion into just increasing agriculture as a whole, 
um, which could help with, or I mean increasing irrigation as a whole, which could help your agricultural section or uh, sector, but quite frankly, that'll just increase water usage and could cause long-term problems down the line. Um, second solution, you could invest that billion into desalination technology, um, which seems effective, but might not go anywhere. Uh, the third, and my most favorite, is a downsize of the agricultural sector. Um, we are already losing jobs consistently each year within agriculture, and quite frankly, looking at these drought numbers in the future, our agricultural industry may just, it may just be dead in 50 years anyways. So rather than waiting this 50 years for a chaotic transition of jobs going from one sector to the next, it would be, it, um, it would be <laughs> advised to um, invest in alternatives such as energy production. Uh, you could build solar panels or wind turbines on these same uh, lands, which could effectively uh, increase your energy supply, which could lead to des desalination becoming more of an option. Uh, Middle East use it because they have such a large energy market. Um, and it really just would help people as well. Uh, they, those farmers, those rural farmers who own that land, now would be having an alternative source of income instead of just relying on their agriculture, which will continue to uh, decline. And just one last emphasis, this is an intertwined problem. We can't just look at this economically, we have to look at it socially with education, we have to look at it, we just have to look at it from all aspects, because if you're only looking at one, you're gonna cause problems everywhere else. We need to look for sustainable solutions. And um, with that, we'll open up for questions, and just in closing this, I know this is a kind of a dry topic, but it is really important, and uh, different. I have a question. <laughs> I'm from Oklahoma. If you drain Lake Tahoe, how long would that satisfy California's water demand? It's actually a serious question. We're not sure. We can get those numbers back to you, but at the end of the day, this is a problem that's going to be impacted yearly. And so, like, just using the water stored in one lake might... Uh, it's a really big lake. It might delay the onset... Really, of, really big. ...of this water need. Three years big. Three years. Yeah. Well, this is a 35-year drought. I know, but so. uh, there's been some talk about this <laughs> as the last extreme measure. Lake Tahoe is 2,000 feet deep. It's got a shitload of water in it. Sounds like an extreme measure. And being a Californian myself, I have uh, kind of working under the assumption that I don't know if Californians would be able to follow that. But that seems like a plan that could be pushed. I am curious if Congress would be able to sell that to Californians. It's a national treasure. <laughs> okay, thanks.